When we look at the rock cycle on our planet, it's tempting to think that sedimentary rocks originate at far off destinations and deep in the earth and other places that are hard to get to, just like metamorphic and igneous rocks do. But what if I were to tell you that there are places you could go to see sedimentary rocks being made? Would it surprise you to hear that new sedimentary rocks are actually being created much closer to home? One has to ask, where are sedimentary rocks created? Now, before we tackle this question, it's important to remember it can take millions of years to transform sediment into sedimentary rock through the process of lithification, the process that involves compaction and cementation of sediment. These processes are slow under most conditions. But if we could press the fast forward button and accelerate the flow of time, we would find that there are many places where new sedimentary rocks are being created across our planet. We call these places depositional environments. They are also known as sedimentary environments. They are locations where sediment is deposited. In other words, these are places where there is sedimentation. Some of the sediment that is deposited may ultimately become rock. When we look at sedimentary rock, one of our main goals should be to determine its depositional environment its place of origin. In order to accomplish this goal, we need to draw on a knowledge base that scientists have been developing for hundreds of years. They have developed this knowledge base by studying not just the rocks on our planet, but also the environments that exist on Earth today. It's pretty easy to see that there is a wide array of potential depositional environments on this world and that they are all unique in their own ways. Indeed, it's probably safe to say that they have their own unique combinations of physical, chemical, and biological processes that affect their sediments and ultimately determine what sorts of rocks form from them. The physical, chemical, and biological characteristics of a rock that are related to its depositional environment are called its facies. Naturally, it takes time to learn the knowledge and skills to look at a rock and determine its depositional environment. Let's focus our effort now on simply exploring the range of depositional environments that exist on our planet. This illustration depicts a number of them. A good starting place may be to separate them. We can distinguish between terrestrial environments located on land and marine environments located beneath the ocean. There are also transitional environments that are neither fully terrestrial or fully marine, but rather somewhere in between. Where do you draw the lines between these environments? A good approach is to think about the water in the environments. After all, water is one of the most important agents of weathering and erosion, and a lot of sediment tends to accumulate in the oceans, rivers, and lakes of our planet. The ocean, of course, consists of salt water, and terrestrial environments contain fresh water in rivers, lakes, streams, and ponds. That just leaves transitional environments. They contain brackish water. Brackish water is low salinity water created by the mixing of salt water and fresh water. You find this along the coasts and at the mouths of freshwater rivers where they meet the ocean. Now, Let's dig deeper by taking a whirlwind tour of depositional environments. 
Wind is one of the most important processes affecting sediment on land. It affects a variety of depositional environments. An aeolian depositional environment is an environment where winds shape the landscape, creating large aeolian landforms like sand dunes. These environments take their name from the Greek god Aeolus, who is the keeper of winds. It is possible to identify sedimentary rocks produced in aeolian depositional environments by looking for sedimentary structures. These sedimentary structures include unidirectional ripple marks and large-scale cross beds produced by the migration of dunes across the environment. You can also identify ancient and modern aeolian processes by the presence of loess. Loess is a yellow, wind-blown dust made up of silt-sized particles. This dust tends to accumulate as sediment. Loess covers roughly 10% of the Earth's surface and is somewhat common in the Midwest, where it was deposited during the last glacial period. Ice can also affect the weathering, erosion, and deposition of sediment. Glacial depositional environments are environments where ice is the main agent that transports sediment. Wind and water also play a role, but ice sheets and glaciers reign supreme. You may be asking yourself, how exactly does this work? You may recall that ice plays a key role in the mechanical weathering of rock, as freeze thawing causes rock to fracture and create new clasts. In this way, the melting and freezing of ice does directly impact weathering. But glaciers also play a key role in erosion. Glaciers displace and transport rocks as they grow and flow over a landscape. As they pass over an area, they will pick up rocks and redeposit them at the end of the track. They affect the landscape a bit like a hoe. A hoe is used to till a farm. As the hoe is moved over the land, it churns up the material beneath it. In the case of glaciers, this tilling causes rocks located beneath the glacier to grind against each other and to move away from their place of origin. More weathering and more erosion. At the forward tip of the glacier, sediment may accumulate. This sediment may turn into a sedimentary rock. This sedimentary rock is called tillite, which is not surprising given how it forms. It is also sometimes called dimictite. Generally, these rocks are conglomerates that contain no sedimentary structures. They are poorly sorted with large, rounded grains surrounded by fine-grained rock, as you see in this picture. The large, pebble-sized grains in tillite are often faceted and striated. In other words, they have long striations or scratch marks and grooves, like the ones shown here. These are produced when the glacier drags the rocks across other rocks beneath it. Of course, wind and ice are not the only agents of sediment transport on land. In fact, water is probably the most important agent overall, and it dominates in a number of terrestrial depositional environments. These environments include swamps, as well as lacustrine depositional environments like lakes and ponds. These are all bodies of water surrounded by land. They are generally connected by fluvial depositional environments, such as rivers and streams. It's difficult to generalize about sediment in lacustrine and fluvial environments. The texture of sediment depends on the energy of the water. How fast is it moving, and in what direction? In fast-moving streams, only gravel and pebble-sized grains may sink to the bottom. The rest of the sediment will be washed away. If so, you'll be left with a conglomerate, or breccia. Alternatively, if it is a slow-moving stream, sand and silt may be deposited as finer-grained sedimentary rock. In any case, 
One important type of fluvial depositional environment is called an alluvial fan. An alluvial fan is a triangular shaped deposit, usually created by rivers and streams that flow downhill out of an elevated or mountainous region. As the river or stream flows out of the mountains, it drops coarse grain sediment on the area below. The fan is created because as the stream flows downhill, it sometimes changes course or forks into two. The dynamics are complex and hard to predict, but the existence of an alluvial fan is a good indication of flowing water. Interestingly, there's a growing body of evidence from rovers to suggest that some craters on Mars have alluvial fans. The alluvial fans start at the tops of the craters and expand down toward the base. These observations support the theory that liquid water was once present on the surface of the red planet, boosting speculation that Mars may have once supported life of some kind. Back on Earth, we can now turn our attention to transitional environments, the environments with brackish water. These include river deltas, beaches, lagoons, and tidal flats. A deltaic depositional environment is an environment located at the mouth of a river, where water flows out into a slower moving body of water, like the ocean. As the river flows into the ocean, the current slows down and loses energy. As it loses energy, it releases the sediment it has been carrying downstream. Closest to the mouth of the river, coarse grain sand is deposited. The smaller silt and clay sized grains are carried further out to sea and deposited on the outer edges of the delta. Beach depositional environments often develop near deltas. Beaches receive sand that originates in deltas before migrating up and down the coast. Not surprisingly, these environments tend to produce sandstones with sedimentary structures such as wave ripples. Near beaches, you sometimes find lagoons. Lagoonal depositional environments are bodies of water separated from the open ocean by barriers such as islands or sandbars. Because lagoons are separated from the open ocean, they do not experience the same waves, tides, and currents that you find on a beach. The water in a lagoon may be very calm and quiet. The water does not move. Because a lagoon is a low energy environment, its conditions are ideal for the deposition of clay and silt sized sediment. For this reason, many shales and siltstones originate in lagoons. Of course, not all transitional environments are immune from tidal changes. In tidal depositional environments, the deposition of sediment is controlled by the ebb and flow of the tide. In tidal flats, for example, which are only covered by water during certain periods of the day, sediment is only deposited during high tide, when the water level rises and sediment is brought in from the ocean. Rhythmites are a good indication of tidal environments. Rhythmites are sedimentary rocks that are, well, rhythmic. The layers are laid down with an obvious periodicity and regularity. The strata consist of repeating sequences of strata. In the case of tidal rhythmites, each sequence represents the ebb and flow of the tide. Because the tide repeats itself, the rock contains the same sequence of strata over and over again. The open ocean lies beyond the tidal environments and lagoons and beaches. In some places, there are reefs, which besides being ecosystems made of diverse forms of life, are also depositional environments. In these depositional environments, organisms may play a key role in the deposition of sediment. Corals produce massive frameworks on the sea floor made of calcium carbonate minerals like calcite and aragonite. These frameworks cover sediment, and as they grow, they expand over sediment that is deposited in the area. Ultimately, the framework may become part of a sedimentary rock that forms. 
In any case, reefs are not representative of most marine depositional environments. As one ventures from the coast out to sea, they will come across a number of changes along the sea floor. The relatively shallow part of the ocean is called the continental shelf. It is generally less than 400 feet deep and extends about 50 miles from the coast. Beyond it, the ocean deepens. A steep continental slope leads down into the abyssal plain, the part of the seafloor between 10,000 and 20,000 feet deep. These different depositional environments are very different. The steep continental slope frequently experiences underwater avalanches of sediment called turbidity currents. Under the influence of gravity, sediment on the slope will slide downhill toward the abyssal plain. As a result, the bottom of the continental slope, an area known as the continental rise, commonly accumulates sedimentary rocks with graded bedding. Things are different on the continental shelf, where the water is shallow. Here, the deposition of sediment is strongly influenced by waves. Waves agitate the seafloor and kick up sediment. They create turbidity. Under these conditions, only coarse grain sediment, like sand, is deposited. Of course, waves only extend to a certain depth in the ocean. We call this depth the wave base. On the continental slope and the abyssal plain, the ocean is deeper than the wave base, and the waves on the ocean surface do not affect sediment on the sea floor. As a result, the sea floor remains quiet and undisturbed. In these environments, fine grain clay and silt sized grains can be deposited. Given the role that waves play in the deposition of sediment in the ocean, and how most sediment comes from rivers on land, we can generalize and say that sediment grains get smaller as you venture further and further out to sea from shallow to deep water. At this point, such generalizations are helpful for thinking about depositional environments. Of course, as you learn more about them, you will inevitably find that they are far more complex than meets the eye. So, while this concludes our whirlwind tour of Earth's depositional environments, it's important to remember that we have barely scratched the surface in describing the complexities of these settings. There is still so much more to explore.